Great, it's three o'clock, so let's get started. Welcome to the fourth session of our Failure to Disrupt book club. This week, we're gonna be talking about peer-guided learning at scale and network learning communities. And we're very fortunate to be joined by Natalie Rusk and Mitch Resnick from the Lifelong Kindergarten Lab at MIT, um, who are the developers of the Computer Clubhouse program and then the Scratch programming language and community that I'm sure many of you know about and we'll get to hear a lot more about today. And then Audrey Waters joining us today as well to help keep our conversation moving forward. For those of you who are joining us live, would invite you to introduce yourself in the chat, tell us a little about, about who you are and where you're coming from. And of course, as we're going along, we'll try to keep our eye on the chat um, for questions that folks have or uh, comments they want to make. We've had some great back channel in previous sessions, and so uh, looking forward to having that continue. So as a way of get to getting to know our guests, uh, once again, we'll invite them to tell us a little bit about who they are and what they're working on and then their ed tech story. Um, what was the, what's, the, what's one education technology encounter or event or experience that uh, somehow set you on the path you're on or has some distinctive part of, you know, uh, distinctive place in your memory? And why don't we go ahead and start with Natalie? Um, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about who you are and, and how you got here? Sure. So Natalie Rusk, uh, I'm a, my title is research scientist at the Media Lab and the Lifelong Kindergarten Group. I'm really an uh, educator and a developer of resources and initiatives. And um, let's see, I, it was about more than 30 years ago I first uh, came to study technology and learning and, um, at Harvard, but actually I ended up spending most of my time at MIT where Mitch was still a grad student at the time with Seymour Papert. And I took uh, Seymour Papert's course, Edith Ackerman's course. And I started um, also volunteering with, to help out with programmable Lego, the Lego logo activities, both at the museum where parents and families, and then also in the Boston Public Schools, there was initiative from the, the group Seymour and Mitch and others were doing work there, both with logo programming and the programmable Lego. So I started helping out in the classroom. And I remember one thing, one of the moments that stands out for me in helping, there was a fifth grade class. I, I helped out in first grade, fifth grade, the teachers were learning, were leading the activities, but I was helping kids along the way. And I remember there was a fifth grade girl who had built a car from Lego and she was excited to be starting to program it. And she wanted to know if she wanted to make it go all the way across the table, how, how should she program it? And um, we talked about how if you said on for 10, well, why don't you see how long that goes? And then it just went, but she wanted it, it went for one second, but she wanted it to go further. So I was like, well, okay, how long? I wanted to go four seconds. Well, okay, if on for 10 is one second, how long would you have to go? She had absolutely no idea. She just had a really blank look. So instead of telling her, I was like, oh, well, why don't you try experiment, try different numbers. So she was, you know, experimenting with different things and like catching it if it was going off the table. And um, it was a iterative process and she actually was counting and then we um, used a watch then to try to be more accurate with her counting. But anyway, I remember at one point she called me, she was like, she figured it out. She was like, oh, when you go on for 20, it goes two seconds. When you go on for 30, it goes three seconds. And it was just like this light bulb. She was so excited and she had figured it out. And here she was a fifth grader. And I'm sure they had been doing times tables or number lines. But I think it's just like if you fill in a worksheet and you just get it handed back, it doesn't have this meaning. Whereas you're trying to get your car to go, it's suddenly there's like a relationship and you're seeing, is it going how long? And she was starting to build that. So I just think um, all along it was just her excitement in figuring that out and that the numbers meant something that she actually wanted to do. And I think that was one of the things that kept me going and I, I still remember. Yeah, yeah, you know, as I think as Mitch has said in other things, you know, how often is it that in math class you learn skip counting or ratios and a student runs up to the teacher and says, thank you, thank you so much. I'm so excited to yeah, learn. You're right. Yeah, you have that in the book, the, that story um, about thanking for score. And this was a similar thing. Yeah, where numbers were like, helped her accomplish something. 
Right, they got the car across the table. That's great. Thanks, thanks, Natalie. Um, and Mitch, how about you? What's your ed tech story? Again, I started, again had a winding path. In college, I had majored in physics, but I wrote for the college newspapers. When I graduated, I was a science journalist for a number of years, which I think also relates to education. I want to help people understand things. But then I moved into education. I got inspired by work that Seymour Papert was doing, came to MIT. Seymour Papert, who helped, uh, you know, was one of the first people at the Media Lab and developed the logo programming language and is sort of a signature thinker. And uh, sort of like a pioneer in thinking about education technology, along the themes that we're going to be talking about today of trying to bring a different approach to learning. So I think I, I got involved because it sort of made sense to me that I sort of known about the idea of using, you know, technology that could be used for just delivering instruction or to, you know, to ask a quiz question and get a response. This is, again, this back in the like 1980s, it was a long time ago. Uh, but that early stage of things were there. But, but I was really appealed to a very different vision of similar to what Natalie was, the example Natalie was talking about, of giving kids the opportunity to learn through creating things and experimenting and exploring. And some of that appealed to me, it felt to me, it wasn't just a good strategy for learning new things. It was also a more humanistic way. It was the right way to treat people. That's the way I'd want children to grow up in the world. So I was very, I found that appealing. And I remember one example in those early stages, around the same time where Natalie's story was taking place, it was a workshop that actually both, Nat, we were both involved in with teachers using some of the same technology that Natalie was talking about. We were both working on using the logo programming language that Seymour developed to control things with Lego, uh, it's Lego logo. And we did this workshop with teachers and the thing that struck me the most, and I think had a big impact for, you know, throughout my career is the way that at this workshop, the different teachers use the same materials in such different ways. Mm. So, and we left it open to them to work on projects that connected to science that they really cared about. So like there was one teacher who really liked music and she, program like a little bit of an arm with a, assigned to a toy xylophone. So it would play the xylophone. You could program it to play, physically play the xylophone. And another one had a, a pet hamster and used some sensors to keep track of what the hamster was doing. And another one came from New Orleans and made like a Mardi Gras scene with things spinning around. It was like a kinetic sculpture that captured the spirit of Mardi Gras. And for me, that idea that each of them connect with these materials in their own way. And I saw that they really got engaged and struck me it was so important that they were gonna go back to their classrooms and then we followed up and saw that they used it with their students in that way. And just the importance of each of them following, having multiple pathways for engaging with these ideas. And not only were they using the same materials, but they were learning made the same ideas. They were learning the same problem solving skills and design skills. Uh, collaboration skills, but building on something that they really cared about. So for me, that really had a big impact. And I think it's been at the core of approaches that Natalie and I have taken over the years. Uh, yeah, and that's what the idea of building on, especially young people's interests or educators' interests, um, is what motivated us to start the clubhouse, the computer clubhouse. Actually, I was working in a museum and there were some kids who came in actually to use the programmable Lego. And then, um, and they were coming back every day and getting really excited about it, speaking in Spanish to each other. And then um, uh, after that week, it was a school vacation week. The next week they came in and um, they were looking for that opportunity, but it had just been a special program. And so, um, it turns out then I got an email saying there's kids sneaking in the museum and you should call <laughs> security to call. And I'm like, no, no, they're coming. They want to create things. They want to do things. And so um, that's what led us. I, I started looking to see where there after school programs in the area where they could go and create. And at the time there really weren't, wasn't a space where they could build and make things using technology. Um, or any materials, really. Um, so, and that remains a problem in many cities, in many places. Nicole Pinkard um, from Northwestern has done some great audits of Chicago, where she said, "Look, you know, there's a basketball court within X hundred yards of every family in Chicago, but you know, in every neighborhood across all different kinds of socioeconomic divides and red lines and things like that. But the maker spaces are all." 
concentrate on the north side of Chicago and they don't exist in the same degree in the south side of Chicago. And, you know, she has a great line. You can't be what you can't see. Um, if these opportunities aren't there for you to explore and experience, then you can't, you know, imagine yourself participating in them. And, and it wasn't just the access to the technology, but also the way the technology was being used. But see, I think we you know, saw that there were places that, you know, where kids could go, but where they could take a course to learn how to use a spreadsheet, where they could go in and play games. There was no place where they could create and build on thing, you know, create, experiment, explore. Yeah, so access to machines, but not access to the ideas that you're trying to get. Exactly. But I interrupted you, Natalie. You're, you're, you're... No, no, no. That's exactly what I wanted to talk about is just we really wanted to create a space. It was actually, you know, really building on the ideas that some of the, you know, that we had seen working, you know, in the school, but it's often was it's like part of the school day. It's like Lego time now, go back to our usual thing. And how could we make this more available for more kids and have Part of the idea too was to have adult mentors there who are also creating in the space so that you had people that you had support um, and you had like materials for creating with. And it was also from the beginning to make sure to reach all kids from all backgrounds, especially those who hadn't had the opportunities. Yeah, so the focus really was on kids in low income neighborhoods having access who didn't, who wouldn't have had the, you know, opportunities in you know in school or in other spaces so then you all went and you created this network of computer clubhouses and i think one of the things to me that's really interesting there is that you were thinking about what kinds of activities and pedagogies and routines do we want people to do what's the technology that we want them to interact with but then what's the context you know who are the adults that are there how are things set up how do people interact with them and sort of you know thinking not just about you know not just about lego logo and a, and a certain kind of education technology but how that education technology gets used in a broader context um, yeah. and then scratch in some sense so scratch is both a programming language but it's also an online space and community you know it scratches a little bit like the online context um, that sort of replaces, that doesn't have to replace, but in a sense replaces computer clubhouse in that model. And instead of having Lego logo in these computer clubhouses, you have the scratch programming language in this online environment, which again is an online environment, which is meant to, you know, foster certain kinds of practices, but not others, encourage, you know, certain kinds of behaviors, but not others. Like what, what were the things that you learned in the process of doing all this work in the computer clubhouses um, that became kind of core principles for developing Scratch. And, and in fact, Scratch really, the idea for Scratch grew out of our work in the clubhouses. So the first clubhouse opened was in 1993. Natalie, do I have the year right? I think it was 1993 was the very first clubhouse. And it gradually grew and by the middle of the 90s, there were a half dozen of them and then started growing. But one thing we saw from our work at the clubhouses is that a lot of the kids who came wanted to create their own interactive stories and games and animations, but there weren't good tools for doing that. Some of the traditional programming languages for kids hadn't kept up with the times and the kids couldn't make their own rich, couldn't use the rich media that was coming out in all of the kids, you know, children's products in those days or teen products. But also they couldn't use they weren't ready to use adult, you know, the professional programming languages like Java or C++. And some other specialized apps were too narrow. It didn't meet, meet what the kids needs. So we saw there was a need. So it really grew up what, what the young people at the clubhouses wanted. So that's what inspired us to get started. It was about 10 years after we opened the first clubhouse, we said we really need to make a new tool. So around 2002, 2003, we started thinking about how to make this new tool. But as you said, it wasn't just gonna be a programming tool for making your own stories and games. But since we've seen the collaborative aspect of the meet of the clubhouses was so important, we wanted Scratch also right from the beginning to be a community. So we, we created an online community at the same time we created the programming language. So kids could create their stories, games, animations, and then share them online for others. Uh, and again, it does fit in with the, the, the chapter of the book that we were reading. This idea of having this online community really fits in with the sort of peer guided learning. And I think we saw it as really different from like in your earlier chapters, where you talked about instructor guided or algorithm guided. In our mind, 
those are types of things that we were trying to move away from, uh, that we saw those as reflecting a, an approach to learning and education that was based on a delivery model, that you were delivering instruction or delivering content, whether it was a human teacher delivering or a machine delivering. And we really wanted a very different approach where it was much more of providing a context and environment and support for young people to explore, experiment, design, create. And the peers is part of that, uh, but in fact, it's just part of it. So I think it was peer guided, but there's a whole collection of things. Do get, do get talked about in the chapter. We've sometimes talked about it in terms of these four ideas of projects, passion, peers, and play. The four That's P's. Part. The four <laughs> P's of creative learning. So we see the goal is creative learning. Having kids grow up as creative thinkers, which we think is so important in today's world. And the best way to support kids as creative thinkers is to engage them and provide them with opportunities to work on projects based on their passions in collaboration with peers in a playful spirit. Yeah, one thing I appreciated in um, you called out in your chapter that often these very different approaches, Justin, are using a lot of the same, talking about the same goals. Like if you uh, look World Economic Forum, a lot of places, the 20 so-called 21st century learning skills too is like creativity, communication, collaboration. And then when you get to what is the actual approach, I'm glad that you highlighted that, that it, it is very different often. Although maybe not, you know, I feel like there's also maybe it's, um, it'd be good to, we'll, we'll talk more about like, is it exactly the way that, you know, how we think about it. So it's not just like open and we don't give you any support. I think sometimes people don't see the support that is there, but I think we really agree. Like, you know, the subtitle about um, what, what actually Seymour Papert and our, our group is called technocentrism, like that you're really calling that out, that it's always, I mean, I'm old enough at the beginning of my career, I remember was like, and we're going to do a CD-ROM or there's like a laser disc technology was like going to be the answer. Cause like you could have a whole encyclopedia of information there. It would all fit on one disc. Like, it's only this yeah. big. Yeah. And so, and I, I think, yeah, we, we definitely agree with you that like now it's, and I remember VR, it's weird. VR has had two waves 30 years apart about like, Kids could go to the bottom of the ocean, explore, and like, what are you going to see at the bottom of the ocean? I'm not sure, but anyway. Um, uh, so anyway, this whole idea that technology is going to be the thing that changes. And there is also like a very much of a, you know, there's um, corporate often interests behind some of those initiatives, right? Of like, we're going to sell you the latest technology. And I think um, the AI machine learning one is one that we are, really skeptical of as like now that's the latest one that people are pinning on either as important for kids to learn or that that's somehow going to help them in their learning process. So, and again, I mean, like you said, it's like at least not technology alone, but also just being very much more critical. And I think, you know, you raise a lot of questions for people to think about is like, what model of education are we, are we talking about here? So, um, I think, yeah, rather than just thinking about the technology, thinking about the approach and the context in which it's being introduced. Well, that, you know, I think that context piece is something which, is, which I've always found really interesting about your work. And I, I pointed to my students a, a lot too, this idea that, you know, Scratch couldn't have existed without having a bunch of time in computer clubhouses saying like, what do kids want and how do they interact with each other? And um, you know, what's the, what's the reality of, of these circumstances? You know, a lot of my undergraduates at MIT who wanna go right into education technology, they're usually not happy when my advice is go teach in a classroom, go work in an after school program, go figure out what like people actually need in those circumstances. Um, but another point you brought up there, Natalie, was this idea that, you know, I think, I think part one argument that the book makes um, is that one challenge of peer guided learning environments, especially as they've got integrated into schools, but also I think in informal contexts, is that if you're, is if you're leaving a lot of the work of the learning experience of participants to peers, then that learning experience can feel disjointed. You know, at, in its best, it can feel sort of serendipitous, like, oh, look at these kind of new things coming at me. Um, but it can also feel like, ah, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do here, or this, you know, you know, you say, we wanted to build something that's really different. Well, if you build something that's really different, it feels really different. It feels unexpected. It feels like I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Um, 
So what are, you know, what do you feel like are some of the, the supports and guides and other kinds of things that you've been working on to have something both, you know, be exciting and unfamiliar, but also accessible um, and, and learnable to participants who are, you know, sitting at home, wherever they are in the world? Should I start? Yeah, why do you want to talk about that? You can. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I do think like we had that even with a computer clubhouse, some people would come in and they just say oh, it was so unstructured because young people had agency and we were, you know, the people, and again, it's like Gail Breslow, Stina Cook and others who really led a lot of the spread, um, the clubhouse ideas. Um, there, there's a lot of thought that goes into it and a lot of supports that you people might not recognize. So even though young people have agency and are building on, there's a lot of examples. There's examples on the wall when you go in. Um, and Just you know, like there's examples on the homepage on the Scratch thing. There's sort of exactly, yeah. So like in Scratch, so um, there's a lot of support that people might not realize. I mean, every day the community team is highlighting certain examples of being young people who highlight, curate examples. There's a Scratch design studio with a prompt. There's tutorials when you come in that we've developed. Um, they really try to highlight examples from a lot of different young people so that you see a range of projects at different levels. Um, there's a lot in terms of this whole idea of open, you know, there's like a lot of um, moderation that's going on, the whole community and moderation team. There's a great Berkman report recently that talks about some of that work. It's, it's a lot of the work uh, comes in through there. And then um, there's feedback both from peers. There's also like Scratch itself. I mean, when I asked, so I've worked with others on the resources team to make the tutorials and there are a lot, especially in the new version of Scratch. When I ask young people, like, how did you learn Scratch? They almost always say either by looking at other people's projects or by, I just like experimented and figured it out. And you can, you know, I'm not saying it's all self-guided because again, we do have, and like, you know, I've created these like scratch cards and um, with others. So there's a lot of supports in there. And again, some of it might not be so apparent, but the work that goes into what are the examples that you see when you come in and, um, and what's highlighted and what are some invitations that are on there. And as well as I think, there's also, and we can get back to that later, but just the way that we imagine it introduced in a classroom is somewhat different than I think it was described in the book of kind of like, okay, just go for it. We almost always, you know, when we're working even in and out of school, there's usually a shared theme um, and there's like a structure to the workshop so that even if people are working, they're working on different projects, but it's a shared theme. There's examples that are given at the beginning. So it's not just, and like you might demo a little bit at the beginning and then you get, you know, started and, you know, and people are helping each other. So the peer part does come in and yet there's also the facilitator or teacher who's structuring the workshop is really thinking about how do we get everyone <laughs> um, to get engaged and, and how do we help everyone get started and start learning from each other. Yeah, I think sometimes there really is this misperception about this type of creative learning approach, or I mean, it's growing out of, as you say in the chapter, the a Dewey, you know, the John Dewey's ideas that you know, for the progressive education movement. And sometimes people characterize that as if just stand back and kids will do wonderful things on their own. And of course, if you stand back, some kids will do wonderful things on their own. But I think we're very aware that you need a whole you know, variety of supports, as Natalie was talking about. So I think sometimes people get the wrong impression about what's going to be needed. And then people might get disillusioned or feel that it doesn't live up to the promise if they do just stand back and say, let it work on its own. But that's not what we intend. So I think it's a big effort to try to make sure that we have that right type of educational support. Actually, Natalie and I just... Uh, our finish up an article that's going to come out next month. It's called Coding at a Crossroads. Uh, and it's about that in the last decade, coding, Scratch being an example, has spread much more quickly and widely than you know, we you know, ever imagined. You know, millions and millions of kids around the world are now using it. On the other hand, we see there's a great risk of sort of, of disappointment and backlash if there's not a similar spread of an educational approach. As we do see in a lot of places, it gets used in a way that's not aligned with the educational ideas. And it's much easier to spread the technology than to spread the educational ideas. 
So we really see that as the challenge for the next 10 years to really live up to the promise to make sure that we, and you know, there are you know, all these great examples out there. So we get so much inspiration from seeing how certain teachers in certain schools are putting this into practice in really wonderful ways, but there's a lot of effort to go on how to you know, help more and more people, more schools, more teachers, you know, put it into practice in this way. There was a great, um, the Chicago Public Schools, there's a principal, Ade, who um, just on Friday, there was a discussion with some of the people from the school who had been implementing Scratch in the classroom along with um, a discussion that with Champika Fernando. So it'd be great to share that as part of the World Education Week. Um, they were discussing how they approached it, how they involved families. So, you know, leadership like that can really bring it in in a way that makes sense. So I think it's less, I do think it's reaching a lot, but how, how you know, again, it's not just the technology, it is what is the pedagogy. And, and I think one way that we look at that is looking if everyone's needing to do the exact same project in the exact same way, you're not really, you know, it's, it's not just two ways to the same thing because what we're looking at, if you really want to develop creativity, young people need to have, to be able to develop their voices, develop their ideas, try something out, see, you know, be able to share something. So like we see on the online community, you see things like kids doing things about climate change, protecting the environment, Black Lives Matter projects. So they're really developing their voice. And I do think the sense of agency, so learning to create, be creative by creating it's not just a different approach. I think, um, I mean, it's not just a different way to the same place, because I think you get to a different place if you really are empowering young people to like think, what do you want to say? What do you want to make? Even if it's within a certain theme that's shared, but like, you know, example, creating, you know, something, pick your favorite book and bring it to life. So we're all working on like a new kind of book report, but really kids are picking something that means something to them. They're bringing characters you know, whether it's fiction or nonfiction to life that matter to them and they're figuring out how to do it. And then they're interested in each other's work as well. Yeah, that was one thing that, did you say it's unjust? No, go ahead, Mitch. Yeah, it was one thing as Natalie and I talked about the chapter. It was one thing that, again, we were feeling that we want to jump in a little bit. Great. On this issue of, sometimes the chapter talks about as if, well, this approach can work as long as kids have that interest and other kids don't have the interest, so it won't work for them. Uh, but at least the way we see it is that, of course, all kids have interest in something. And for the for our main goals of supporting kids learning about, you know, you know, creative thinking and problem solving, you know, you can teach that through all different types of activities. So the example Natalie just gave, which we see a lot, where a teacher might say, you know, find a book that you're really interested in, and then do a scratch project. To sort of tell the story and you know, gives your, that connects to all kids' interests, but it's a way for all kids are gonna have a way of doing it. It's not that it's just an interest that some kids have and then the others lose interest. So we really do see it as something that can involve all kids. And sometimes in the chapter framed it a little bit as if the other approaches, instructor guided or algorithm guided, could reach all kids, whereas we just could reach the one that dived in and became really interested. But we really do think that the goal. And we really feel the best and only way to reach all kids is to really make sure that you're connecting to all their interests. Yeah, I, th I think that I think that's totally fair. That there's some that, that there are some themes within interest-driven learning, which are um, we offer an interest-driven learning experience to people, and if they don't choose it, um, then that can be okay. Um, you, you know, um, and although I think you know perhaps something which is not emphasized enough in the book is that you know I think in some ways you'd like to put creative compute, you know, creative, uh, creative computation alongside reading and writing as a kind of thing that really everyone should participate in. Whereas, you know, for instance, we all might say um, someone who's really interested in making drumming opportunities available to children. It's probably okay if some kids take the drumming opportunities and other kids don't take the drumming opportunities, like that can be all right. Um, what, what did you think of this? I'm, I'm, I'm interested to hear your thoughts uh, about how you measure success. Um, because I do think the place where there's the sort of strongest contrast between research that comes out of uh, 
uh, Scratch and other kind of peer guided learning communities and research that comes out of algorithm guided instructor guided kinds of things is that, you know, there's a lot of work in like we had Neil and Christina Heffernan here last week talking about assessments and their main question is does the distribution of math proficiency on average in that classroom sort of shift to the right? You know, if, if kids were getting 25 out of 40 problems correct before they were using assessments, are they getting 27 or 28 out of 40 problems correct after using assessments? Um, and my sense is that most of the research on Scratch has been focused more on um, what are the, what are the, you know, some of the most compelling examples of people developing really, you know, exciting projects, expressing themselves in an interesting way. I think this idea too, that you've both talked about it in a number of places, which I think I understood, you know, it's, you know, sometimes you figure things out more after writing and talking about things and then they don't make it in. Um, but this idea of creative divergence, I had Andy Slowinski who worked on your team for a number of years. Um, he came into my class and he was talking about, um, how they sort of develop and test new features. And Andy described that, that the idea of creative divergence was one of the short-term measures that seemed most important to him. Um, if we add this thing, do you see participants creating more different kinds of things with it? Or do you, if you add this thing, do you see people doing the same kinds of things with it? Um, how, you know, what, what, what in the book do you, was missed or was sort of on the right track in terms of how you all at the Lifelong Kindergarten Lab are sort of measuring the, measuring the effects of what you're doing and measure, doing that measuring to try to make things better? Go ahead, Natalie. <laughs> okay. I do think, I mean, as you said, you know, Often people are looking at, it can, it, it can get frustrating looking at how people are assessing Scratch because even though we talk about the goals of creativity, problem solving, developing your voice, people are like, okay, so were they using Boolean operators or not? And like, <laughs> this is and not so, exactly about Boolean operators. That is like one thing, but it's not the <laughs> thing actually. <laughs> I know. And it, I also get, it's like, actually it's but not- it's easily that measured. That, that's the reason people go there is because yep. you can't easily measure that. So the things we're most interested in are really difficult to have quantitative measures. So people gravitate towards the quantity of measures, and that's really frustrating. But I do think, you know, if you look at trajectories over time, which again, isn't so easy to see, but it's, it's like fascinating. And sometimes it's not reflected on what's shared on the website, but we hear back from a young person about their trajectory. And it's not, I think people just think like, okay, they just get good at coding, or maybe some are very social, but it's this interweaving and kids are constantly saying, oh, and my art, I, I developed art skills and I really de developed like how to solve problems and do coding, like they're mixing those up and the community is so important, like I, and the contribution to the community. So Ricky Rose Roque and I, you know, talked to some long-term scratchers about their trajectory, but we're hearing this from others too. And again, it's not to say that everyone, but partly is like, it's not just like, well, some kids, but it's like, how do we create conditions so that all kids feel like they can become fluent? And that's when kids get really excited. They have enough experience and time to experiment and like, you know, it's interesting enough. Once they start to realize that's what we've found in our research about motivation around it is like, I could do anything with this. Like I could say anything. I could make this, this or that. That's so exciting. And it's also the social piece, the peer learning part that you're highlighting is what keeps kids coming back. It's yes, they like making projects about anything they want, but it's like, oh, and someone saw it or I could learn from somebody else. And that peer part is a motivation part. And like someone valid, someone cares that I'm here. Someone like, liked my thing or asked me to collaborate. Kids who've been doing it for years, they still remember the first time someone liked their project or left a comment or asked, can I use your character in my thing? So it's those connections. And then um, Shruti Darwal in our group too has done the scratch memories work where she was really as a response to this narrow focus that a lot of researchers are taking on scratch of only looking at blocks. She really was making a tool in her, her thesis of, um, she made this tool that celebrated kids' whole trajectories in Scratch. Like, here's how many, you know, here was the first person who remixed your project. Here was the first project you liked. Here's how many kids from around the world you're connected with. And I mean, just kids loved it because it recognized and they started remembering. So it's just how do we celebrate their whole trajectory and look at the trajectory from where, 
you know, where they started and where they came and like, how can we provide more of that opportunity for it not just to be, we're introducing coding for one or two weeks and then we're moving on to the more advanced language. That's not how you become fluent. You don't switch like from learning Spanish for two weeks, now let's go to, you know, another language. You really need time to develop that fluency. And, and that's to some extent a critique of, you know, maybe programs like CS50 that say, okay, do two weeks, CS50 is Harvard's introductory computer programming class, where they do two weeks of scratch and then move on to a different language. Um, and, uh, you know, but you're sort of proposing staying with it more. Um, and you said a piece in there about sort of uh, doing research that focuses on what blocks people are using. What, what were you referring to there? <laughs> I don't want to name it, but there's a certain tool people use that automatically counts out, scores your project based on, and it's, it assumes the more blocks, the better, which actually, if you know more about computer science, that's not really the thing. <laughs> and it's not about, you know, so it's just, and yeah, it has this grading system. I mean, if you understand it, but I think for a lot of people, it's just like the more blocks, the more different kinds of blocks, you get a higher computational thinking score, which doesn't really make sense, but it is an easy tool to use and like people are looking for an easy way to measure so a lot of people have adopted it. I mean I would say in contrast um, one, one piece of research uh, Shaimana Dasgupta and others um, who had studied in life on kindergarten um, then went on to do some quantitative research about scratch but I think it's I like their approach, even though they were looking at blocks, they're like, how does someone's vocabulary grow over time? So again, they were looking more at trajectories and like, how does that develop? And the fact that when young people are looking at other people's projects and remixing them, they showed that even when they went on to other projects, they were picking up concepts, they were learning from others. So it was like less about, you know, did you learn a certain block, but, or, but is their vocabulary and their concepts growing? Yeah. I think sometimes we talk about, you know, with Scratch, our ultimate goal is to have kids develop their thinking, develop their voice, and develop their identity. So Natalie talked about developing their voice and also their identity, how they sort of see this design I can do. They start to see themselves as a creator. They see themselves in their community in a different way. Uh, and if you end up focusing so narrowly on which blocks you use, in fact, you know, it's possible you get some thin slice of developing their thinking. You might get something about how they learn certain concepts, but even there, you're not getting a rich range of how they develop their thinking. You're not getting a sense of, you know, the different problem solving skills they developed. And you're certainly not getting any sense of how they develop their voice or developing their identity. But it's, it's just the easier thing to measure. It gets driven that way. So I think our concern is that we're missing out on the things that we care so much about and that we think are so important and that we think are essential for attracting a broader range. We think so many kids get turned off you know, to learning because it's just focused on the narrow slice of concepts. Um, how do you help kids visualize their trajectory on Scratch? You started talking about that a little bit. Um, you know, and maybe just combining it with, uh, with some of the things that you've said before, which is that there's a, there are a bunch of really sort of complex qualitative things that you're aiming for. You know, like there's not an automated way to detect whether or not someone has found their voice, um, whether or not someone's identity has, has developed in a way that, 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 you know, we would find pro-social and they would find enriching and so forth. Um, and then schools are in this position where, you know, we ask them to track whether or not what they do are working in a variety of ways, um, you know, so that we can use resources efficiently so that we know the kids are getting a good education and those kinds of things. Um, and it seems like a bunch of, you know, some of your, a lot of your research and measurement project is trying to be sort of somewhat, somewhat attentive to the concerns that, that educators would have while also trying to push and expand their thinking. Um, it seems like this idea of sort of visualizing trajectories might be a great way of getting at some of that, that there's a whole bunch of quantitative and qualitative data that's wrapped up in an individual scratcher's experience. Um, and one way we could get that at that is like interviewing every kid and getting them to tell their story. And that might be a good thing to do in schools. But what are, what are some of the other things that you're working on there? I do think, um, like I just mentioned, there right now it's not we want to make it more available but um, if you look at the work that Shruti Darwal did on scratch memories but I think I mean right now the way kids do it is on their profile you can just see the different projects and you can go back in time and they really curate that but some often the, the more 
kids are involved, the, the less projects they have because they start to think, oh, I only want to show these ones. <laughs> you know, some of them just keep up hundreds and others like really only want to show certain ones. So it really is a portfolio type of approach. If you look at their profile page, it's their portfolio of their creations, the portfolio of the galleries and their studios that they've curated. So you get to see what they've created, uh, which we just say you can, you can, that you can get a good sense of what they're learning and how they're developing through looking at that. At least it's one important dimension. Yeah, but of I, often, often in all young people, like there are a lot of unshared projects that you don't necessarily see on there that we never see. So I do think that that's an area. And again, why Shruti has been doing some of that work of like that we need better tools and more kinds of visualizations for, and, and the, the scratch memory is just beautiful because it, it generates for each kid a video with the cat and music and it's celebrating looking back on time and kids start reflecting, you know, on their trajectories by seeing this, this history of their participation. Does it have kind of like a Facebook memories vibe? Yeah, exactly. Friends with like Mitch for, yeah. You've been friends with Scratch Cat for seven years. Here are some of your... <laughs> yeah. Uh, what should you found is as kids watch the videos, first it gets them to reflect on what they did and to rethink some of those things. And they forgot a lot of it. So it gets that it sparks them to reconsider and reflect on it, but also motivates them to do new things because they see that and it sparks new ideas as well. So it's both reflective, but also inspirational for doing new things. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a great bit of, you know, I mean, it must be using sort of algorithms and other kinds of computational tools in some ways. Like if people are really proficient scratchers, they have probably way too much that could fit into a movie. And so the system must like select what to include in some kind of way, um, you, you know, which we sort of, uh, uh, you know, so I mean, it's a great example of hybridity. You know, what are, what are like some limited ways of drawing on, you know, some sort of algorithm guided approaches, but that are in the broader service of, you know, a, a kind of, you know, peer guided pedagogical vision. Um, Colin Northmore, who's a principal, uh, says, uh, you know, I, we make a claim in the book, or I make a claim in the book that um, in many places, you know, the, the full flowering of a bunch of these ideas is probably more likely to happen in the periphery of schools than in the core. Um, but what are the schools that you've been to? Who do you, what, are, what are the places that people could look at or learn more about um, where the kinds of teaching and learning that you're most excited about really is incorporated into the core of the curriculum where you feel like um, you could go there and go, oh yeah, that's what I wanted Scratch to look like. This is, uh, you know, or this is teaching us new things about what Scratch can look like in schools. I mean, I do think we see a lot of different teachers and again I mentioned like Sayer Academy in Chicago Public Schools as like it's um, principals and teachers doing things. I don't know, if, you know, for all of them, obviously it is a challenge to get it so that the whole curriculum is like, you know, that approach. But I think in every case, it's like, how do you bring in more of that peer, more community and changing it? And I do think um, that's a, another question that uh, Christopher brought up. And I would say, I'm definitely less of like, oh, well, they're just two different ways. You know, there's room for both. I really do think we need to change to be more, you know, um, saying anti-racist, anti-sex, all those things. I think things fundamentally have to change. The curriculum fundamentally has to change if we really want young people to feel empowered and to be able to, you know, um, feel like their ideas matter. And I think there's both sort of a short term and a long term, because we do see some schools making like incremental changes and finding ways to fit it in with the current curriculum. And they introduce some more project approaches to it. Like, you know, like there was a teacher in Mexico who already was doing a unit about the life cycle of the butterfly, but then turned it into the kids would observe butterflies, but then create their own scratch animations. And then you, you know, based on that, and then also create their own physical models, you know, using motors and sensors in order to, and it really enriched the model. And it did take somewhat longer, but you found a way to fit it in with, you know, within. But then over time, we do know there are a lot of constraints in the schools where too often the disciplines are separate from each other. Uh, there's, you know, strong boundaries on time. You only get 50 minute to class periods or a week for this, you know, whole unit. And for making a more fundamental change to embrace the types of things that we're working on, we do know there ought to be some more changes to the structures of school to really fully integrate it. So I think it's both a short-term and a long-term strategy. 
So I have two more questions that I want to ask you in our last few minutes. And one of them is just, who else are you really excited about and inspired by? I mean, Audrey and I have discussed some of this before and, you know, kind of like, what are the examples that are, that are like Scratch that are really sort of embracing um, constructionist, but peer guided projects? Like what, what are the, what are the other online tools um, that if people were really excited about your work, you would encourage them to also look at? Or what are the other what are the other things that you, that when you all are thinking about the future of Scratch, you're sort of looking at are there other places you look to and go, oh, what are those folks doing? I bet there's some good ideas there. Well, sometimes it's not online. Like we've been very inspired by the work of our longtime friends and collaborators at the Tinkering Studio at the Exploratorium. That I think do the have the same spirit. Often, that's, much of it is in the physical world, although it's adding computation to the physical world. And we see the type of things there, and we get lots of inspiration from the work that they've done. And then also we get inspiration from groups. You made earlier the point that we do see coding more as a new type of language learning. So it's like learning to write. So we get inspired by the work that's done in you know, the National Writing Project and the way they support you know, kids learning to write because it's about expressing themselves. So the same way that they push against kids just learning grammar and punctuation and syntax, but let them express themselves through writing. You know, we get inspiration for the way we want to see using technology as a new medium and a new language for expression. And, and I think the kinds of social organizations that you all have created, especially within schools among teachers, I'm sure also among informal learning things. I mean, that's a big part of the National Writing Project is basically, um, you know, no matter what kinds of protocols or practices the National Writing Project has, you know, you can't just sort of download their curriculum onto your computer and teach it. You have to be in community with other educators who can help you adopt um, some of these new ideas, much like you all have Scratch Day and sort of all of these other things. Um, can you tell us anything about um, the last nine months, you know, lots of folks that we've talked to in education technology have said, you know, their usage rates are through the roof. Um, and, uh, um, you know, but I, but I bet also, you know, there are probably a bunch of challenges that teachers are running into, you know, if they, if they depend upon um, using their physical classrooms, you know, actually, now like I said before, you know, it was really important to walk into a physical classroom and see a bunch of examples on the wall um, to be able to, you know, give you a sense of what's possible and things like that. Um, what, are you, what are you learning um, from people who are trying to make teaching with scratch work during the pandemic? Well, I would say I do think that people's models of education come out very clearly because people start saying, how are we going to deliver all that content to kids, you know, online? And we're like, wait, that's not, you know, how are we going to engage them in project-based learning could be a different question. And you really are seeing this content delivery model coming into the fore and kids' lack of engagement in that also becoming much more apparent. So I think it really brings, and it is challenging, like someone was saying, how do you have a makerspace without a space? And it isn't easy. And so that's where, again, we're working with our colleagues like at Tinkering Studio, Rick Rose with her family creative learning is like, how do you help people with what they have around them? What can they do? And so not feeling like, and if they don't have access to technology, because the inequities that we're seeing, it's just so hard to see that, you know, that it's like accentuating those. But it, again, it's not about the technology. It's like, how do we have creative learning experiences with whatever you have around you? And how can we start modeling that? I don't think it's easy in this situation, but it really helps to highlight that it's a different approach. It's also, I think, accentuate for us the, the, the need for connection and community. Uh, like just one example, uh, in the Scratch community, like the social activity has really gone up strongly, the commenting. And one example, there was a long time scratcher, actually someone that actually Natalie had interviewed on some of the, her earlier projects. She'd made hundreds of projects when she was in middle school age, but hadn't been on scratch for a couple of years. Uh, she came back, it was last spring, she was, grad, she was a graduating senior in high school and came back to scratch after being away from a couple of years. And so she came back because she wanted to sort of create things and make connection. And she made this project called uh, random acts of COVID kindness. And she offered to be like a clearinghouse for people to make scratch projects for one another that would serve some act of kindness, you know, a, a greeting card for someone. So people could either say someone who needed some kindness or someone had a way to pro 
provide time if you could help somebody else out. Um, and for me, that was first, it was just really touching that you want to come back and you could see the need, the yearning for community and the yearning for connection was there. And also the importance of, you know, these acts of kindness. Uh, so trying to make sure, and I think in what we're doing is we're not just trying, we're certainly not just trying to teach programming, but also it's not just about creative thinking, although that's very important, but also the ways that people interact with one another, engage with each other. And in a time like this, with all of the different challenges that we're facing in society, having kids grow up with the creativity, connection, and kindness, we think is more important than ever before. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I, that is a perfect thought to end with and seems so connected to this idea of the lifelong kindergarten lab, the, the sort of notion that, you know, that, that kindergartens are places where we learn about connection, community, skills, kindness. Um, and then as students get older, um, some of those themes and points of emphasis fall away. Um, but boy, it seems like we probably shouldn't be like taking the gas off kindness in our schools these days, because certainly our society could use uh, much, much more of it. Um, well, thanks for everybody who joined us online. Thanks to Mitch and Natalie uh, for joining us here for this great conversation. It's great to, um, to get your feedback, to get your own perspectives, to push us uh, to see some things in, in some different directions. Um, and this has been a, a really rich and productive conversation. So thanks for joining us. Great. Thanks, everyone. I saved the chat because I think there are a lot of interesting points and questions there. So thank yeah, you sorry. Thanks for having oh. us. Yeah, sorry we didn't get to engage more with the chat, but really thanks for the invitation, Justin. It was great to have an opportunity to talk about these ideas. Terrific. Um, so next week we will be talking about learning games with Scott Osterweil and uh, Constance Steinkohler. Um, I think learning games are great ways to see the three genres of learning at scale and their various forms of hybridity here. And of course, if people want to learn more about uh, Natalie and Mitch's work, you can go to scratch.mit.edu or look up the Lifelong Kindergarten Lab. Um, well, also we'll give a plug to is the yeah. online course that our group uh, offers called Learning Creative Learning. And the next version of it starts just like next week, October 19th. Uh, and several people in our group are, uh, are involved in, in running that. So if people are interested, check out the website. Just you know, search for learning creative learning. Yeah, and, uh, and Natalie's just put that in the chat as well. Strongly recommend it. And it runs asynchronously. You can, so you can do it anytime you want to over a period of six weeks or something like that. Great. Terrific. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Mitch Thank and Natalie, you. thanks so much for, uh, for chatting with us today. And uh, I hope you stay safe and enjoy the rest of the fall. Thanks. Bye. All right. Bye, everybody.